Everybody, we're thrilled you're joining us for today's program, Hood Feminism. Nikki Kendall and Michi Troda talk truth. Before I jump into introductions, could our attendees please click on the chat bubble now to open the chat bar. This is where we're going to communicate with you during the course of the presentation and where you can contact us with questions. Over the next few minutes, please let us know if you have time, where you are in the world and how you heard about the program. Um, I'm Jane Ward, president of Friends of the Edgewater Library and also co-chair of the group's programming committee. In a couple of minutes, only two people on screen will be Mickey and Mich Michi in conversation. At the start of the program, Friends of the Edgewater Library muted you. This courtesy eliminates audio and video interruptions to our speakers. Please do not try to unmute yourselves. We will unmute you when it is appropriate to do so. We are recording the program for playback on the Friends website. And by registering, you've given the Friends of the Edgewater Library permission to use your image and voice when applicable as a part of that recording and its future use online. Mickey and Mitchie will take questions at the end of the talk. Please type your questions into the chat box addressed to the FOEL program hosts and hit enter to send them. During the Q&A period, I will be asking the questions on your behalf. But once the program has ended, we will unmute you all so you can chat directly with our authors for a few minutes. This is your chance to ask any last minute questions, so please hang on Zoom after the Q&A period wraps up. Now we're on to the main program. Nikki Kendall is a writer, diversity consultant, and occasional feminist who talks a lot about intersectionality, policing, gender, sexual assault, and other current events. Her essays can be found in publications such as Time, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, Ebony, Essence, and Salon, plus a host of other sites. She has discussed race, feminism, education, food politics, police violence, tech and pop culture at institutions and universities across the country. She's the author of Amazons, Abolitionists and Activists, and of course, Hood Feminism, both from Penguin Random House. Michi Trota is a five-time Hugo Award winner, British Fantasy Award winner, and the first Filipina to win a Hugo Award. Michi is editor-in-chief of Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America and senior editor of PRISM. She was the exhibit text writer for Worlds Beyond Here, expanding the universe of APA science fiction at the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle. She's been featured in publications like the Chicago Tribune and The Guardian, and has spoken at the Adler Planetarium, the Chicago Humanities Festival, and on NPR. Mickey and Michi, on behalf of the Friends, the Edgewater Branch Library, and all of today's attendees, welcome to you both. I turn the platform over to you, what promises to be a lively conversation. We freeze. Okay, are we there? Yeah, we're here. All right, I think we can start then. Hi, okay. <laughs> thanks for having us. Uh, this is, uh, wow, this is taking some getting used to doing this kind of discussion over format because normally Mickey and I are sitting next to each other and she's patting me on the head and calling me we because I am considerably shorter than she is. <laughs> I'm just going to point out here, I've known Mitchie for oh, five, seven years, something like that. We're going on, let's say, a while. We're just going to go with a while. Yeah. And I routinely pick on her. It's If you've ever seen me do an event with NK Jemison or any of my other friends, like uh, DJ Older, then you should know how this goes. If you have not, I'm serious, but also silly. Buckle up. I mean, this is what make, makes conversations with you actually fun. I mean, there's no, there's no lecture, there's no dry lecturing here. This is the whole like having a discussion about some really serious stuff, but you make it entertaining. And I always end up learning something, which is always the bonus. And I mean, I have been a fan of your work since before we've known each other. I mean, when I moved to Chicago and um, I remember seeing Solidarity is for white women um, popping up when I was just a baby on Twitter 
and not having any idea about what I was doing. And really your work has, was a huge gate opener for me into understanding what feminism really is and how it applies to so much more than what we typically see as a very narrow set of priorities. Um, for a lot of women of color, particularly, finding a way to fit into mainstream feminism has been, um, has been a lot of, uh, involving a lot of discomfort and wondering exactly where you fit in because it seems like there was a constant uh, undertone of having to prioritize gender over race instead of looking at how things intersect. And seeing you talk about these things full up, flat out, without any hesitation and with really a, um, with a much needed tone of why haven't we been talking about this? This is a problem, uh, has been an inspiration for me and my own work. So I'm really thrilled to be able to discuss this with you, um, particularly knowing how much both of us have a lot of feelings about seeing these things manifest in Chicago. Yes. Uh, but we both are Chicago people. I grew up in the Burbs. Um, at some point, we may have actually crossed paths in the 80s, running around a Yorktown mall or something. Maybe. Um, maybe. Shenanigans ensued. Shenanigans. <laughs> but one of the things that I really wanted to start off by talking to you about was food. Because this is a thing that I don't really remember having seen fem mainstream feminism address. Um, but you have been a passionate advocate for food security as an essential basic need that feminism doesn't talk about. So I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, but about how you've seen discussions around issues of food, nutrition, and access mirror the ways that mainstream feminism offers, like sorry, often centers around the needs of middle and upper class white women. So one of the things I'm going to bring up, does anybody remember the soda tax? I know you do. I know you remember being told how important it was to tax soda so that people would be much, much healthier in the city and that poor people would stop buying soda because the soda was bad. Do you also remember when the announcement came out that all that water, uh, the city's water department was doing all of that work in the street? That meant that the lines into the homes were leaking lead and that the city said essentially to business and building owners, oh, we're responsible for the street. The fact that the new piping we put in destroys the lining of the old piping we mandated, and now you have a lead problem, you need to pay to fix that. So every home in Chicago that has a lead problem now, all those schools that they were announced they had a lead problem, I gotta tell you, I'd rather see a kid drinking soda than, than lead wine water. Just gonna put out there that if you heard about Flint and you understood that the lead in the water in Flint was bad, you should understand the lead in the water in Chicago is bad. And you should step back and ask yourself about this focus on soda and sugar and this lack of focus on making sure that the water was safe to drink in the first place. And then you should think about when we're talking about hunger, people say, well, those people in the food stamps, the welfare queen trope, that kind of thing. But they're not worried about making sure the kids can eat in the first place, right? And so when we're combating hunger in the city and people are talking about TIF funds and what we can use them on for development, great, but we still have hungry kids. We still have kids in Chicago who are going hungry every day. There's non-potable water all over the city. There are all of these structures in place and our focus was sugar, which side note, I'm gonna preach this gospel forever. I know people talk about the sugar and soda and I want you, those of you who drink frappuccinos, I want you to spin that bottle around. I want you to go pick up a can of soda. I don't care what can of soda. And I want you to compare the sugar. Surprise, the sugar is higher in the, in the Frappuccino or the nearest flavored coffee drink, pick a flavored coffee drink, than in that can of soda. So it's not really about the sugar, it's about the class. And so I want, when we're talking about Chicago and Chicago's problems and crime in Chicago, go to Inglewood and look around at the grocery stores in Inglewood. 
Heck, you don't have to go to Inglewood. Go to Woodlawn, go to the west side, wander around in Rogers Park further west, head up on away from that little curve, right? Go on down towards uptown and all of that. How many real chain grocery stores are there? And what are the price points in those stores? Because remember, when we're talking about food stamps in America, we're talking about $1.57 per meal per person, right? So when we are, first of all, right, stolen people, Black people in America, stolen people on stolen land, taken from indigenous people, right? We, we, we all know that. Then ask yourself why the people who are currently running our city are so focused on sugar, but not clean water. So focused on whether or not those people are coming downtown, right? What, what controlling teenagers in the Louvre, if they're this color, but Lala tears up the city every year, right? And we've seen the complexion at Lala. So are we really worried about hunger in Chicago or are we really saying that we want to look like we're concerned about hunger a lot of times? and controlling you know, what people are doing and not doing anything to address the actual problems. Yeah, so let's actually talk about that idea of controlling for a bit because you recently did a spot with Kellogg uh, in their new series where they're actually talking about um, food scarcity issues. And you talked a bit about uh, your experience of being on food stamps. And I know you've written about this a little bit in Hood Feminism as well, the idea of food stamps as being a means of control. And it's not actually, when it's supposed to be about providing support and cushion to make sure that you're getting nutrition. Um, if you can talk about that a little bit more because it's, I feel like that is actually a really sharp example of what you're talking about in terms of this isn't actually fixing the problem. It's meant to further control um, a population based on um, you know, white supremacy and our whole idea of it, who actually is valuable and who gets to make choices. So one of the things about food stamps, and you'll see these conversations periodically, the soda tax is an example where the, the, the argument was that it would reduce obesity and increase health and all of that. But you see people say, well, those people are buying shrimp or those people are buying lobster, those people are, are buying junk food, right? Insert the those people sentence here. But $1.57 per meal per person, I want you to walk into your nearest grocery store. I want you to look around and tell me what you can make that is easy, quick to prepare, tastes good, travels well, because fun fact, the working poor often have multiple jobs and are using public transit and costs less than $1.57. What are you gonna pick up? Is what you pick up going to be fresh or is it gonna be shelf stable? How much of it is in that serving? How many calories can you afford to discard, right? Because preparing food from fresh ingredients, whole ingredients, that's wonderful. If you have time to cook, if you have a way to store that food, if, however, you work two or three jobs, which is pretty common in Chicago, especially since we also have a housing crisis based on rent, how much time do you have to prepare food? How much time do you have to grocery shop? We saw this during the pandemic. Yes, we saw shortages, but we also saw people saying, I can't stay in my neighborhood because there's no grocery store in my neighborhood. Or the grocery store in my neighborhood is really a, a corner store or a liquor store that happens to sell some groceries, right? So donating to Chicago Food, British Chicago Food Depository is a thing I do regularly, but I also recognize that for people who are past the income line, so to speak, for needing food stamps or needing to go to a food bank, there's still the question of, are they able to go to the grocery store in the neighborhood? Is there a grocery store? Can they afford the store in the neighborhood, right? We saw those many Whole Foods coming into Inglewood and other neighborhoods, and that's great, it's a source of food. But Whole Foods, even at a reduced cost, may still cost too much for people who are really working from a tight budget. And if Whole Foods is your only option, many of the brands and foods that are familiar to you may not be present, or you may not be able to cook from scratch because of your situation. 
So that's why when we're talking about hunger, we have to think about it more than just, is there food available? But is that food affordable? What is, it, what, what is the, the labor cost of preparing that food? Is that, food some, is that person living someplace where they can store that food? Because I don't know if anyone remembers that big scandal about ROM and the $400 million of CHA funds, but people in shelters, people in unstable housing, they often don't have quality refrigeration if they have refrigeration. And they struggle with vermin problems because Chicago has a wonderful rate of slum landlords, right? We, we know that. So we can't just say, well, those people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. You can be doing all the right things and your real problem is that you're poor. And for women who are heading households with children or elders who are in caretaker positions, you know, they may, and this is where feminism fails, they may simply not have the resources to affect political change and care for those people and, and make sure everyone survives. There's only so many jobs you can do in a day before you run out of energy. Yeah, and I mean, if we're gonna talk about security, you mentioned one of the things that I really wanted to make sure we had a chance to talk about, which is the housing crisis. Um, because I mean, housing security feels like an issue that should be really centered in feminism because it ties to a lot of adjacent issues, particularly domestic violence. But there's also the how necessary it is to have an address in order to access a variety of these social safety nets that are supposed to be there for people who need them and to even gain, uh, to even be considered for a job and find employment. Uh, how have we seen the pandemic exacerbate these issues, particularly with a looming, house, with a looming eviction crisis on the horizon? So one of the things about this had, and this was true before the pandemic, the pandemic is definitely making it worse, is that rents in Chicago have gone up, wages have not. And it's not just Chicago, it's America, and I understand that. But if you are in unstable housing, if your stove is off because your gas bill was too high or your landlord's not paying your gas bill or the water bill or any of the dozen other problems, and then the pandemic hit, were you able to stay in your housing? How safe was the housing you were staying in? Right? Was it comfortable? Could you store things? Because we, got, we saw people getting upset that people were out and about so often. And all I could think as someone who was at the time was living in an apartment building where my upstairs neighbor was pretty continuously having parties. Not everyone's situation is such that being home is the best answer. Sometimes people are leaving their house. They're managing whatever problem they're having with their housing by being outside, by being at libraries or other public places. And now we're in this housing crisis where A, evictions are on the rise, but also landlords are now asking for more, right? So you may need to supply three months rent as your deposit or six months. I've seen some reports that landlords want not just rent, uh, you know, the security deposit and rent, they want you to have a co-signer, they want you to have four times the, the income as opposed to three. I've seen some reports of six times. Well, if you're already struggling, you, you Matt Desmond wrote this book called Eviction, and eviction is amazing. But eviction is an apocalypse in someone's life. Being evicted screws things up for years. Well, if you were already teetering and this eviction pushes you over and then standards have increased since you were evicted, how do you get housed again? And on top of all of that, in the middle of a pandemic, you can't exactly go to a shelter and know the shelter is the best place to be because COVID, right? So you're picking rock and hard place, skillet and fire all the time, over and over. And then we'll say to people who are only being given bad choices and worse choices, why aren't you making better choices? Well, you can't make better choices because you don't have those choices available to you, right? So now you've, you've been coping with the food crisis. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe your landlord was never taking care of the building or not taking great care of the building, and now you've got an eviction to fight, or you, or you can't fight it because you've lost your job and you can't afford your next apartment. And now you're on the street, and maybe now your kids are at risk of being taken by the state. And oh wait, it's Illinois, so we also have a crisis with DCFS. And do you see how this mountain of problems kind of 
you know, you were, you were headed this way and you got knocked back and then you got knocked out again. And now you're down here and you have to figure out how to climb a mountain that is higher, more difficult and more dangerous than it was when you fell down in the first place. When really you were pushed down in the first place. I mean, this, it ties into a whole bunch of other issues as well that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have initially thought of as a feminist issue, but when you look at it through this lens, housing in particular, when we look at the climate crisis and what it is doing on the West Coast, you have natural disasters are now an additional stressor on finding housing and having stable housing and shelters are now not even a, sa a safe option because of the pandemic and for all other reasons. Um, it makes me like, I wonder what your thoughts are on why feminism has not traditionally looked at these issues as something that need to be addressed where we're like, it's usually when housing, it's talking about like women being able to, you know, own, w being able to own property or being able to have a bigger house or be able, being able to do it on their own. And it seems like there is a baseline assumption of what resources women already have in order to focus on some of those larger uh, issues. So I'm going to say this, being able to be a full-time feminist is, okay, you're coming from some level of privilege. Right now, sometimes you've worked your way up to that level of privilege, but usually you started it privileged in some way. If your privilege is financial, which largely for white middle and upper class women, even if they have less than white men at a commensurate level with them, they have more than women in every other group. And when I say women here, I mean cis and trans, I mean non-binary. We are talking about 51% of the population plus. Okay, when we're talking about women. But when we're talking about white women, especially in the US or UK, European context, Western context, the wealth gap, that 75 cents to the white man's dollar number, that number is really white women's number. For black women, it's more like 60. For Latina and um, indigenous women, I wanna say Latinas are around 60 some odd cents. Um, indigenous women are, often not, the math on the data on them is really bad, but it's more like 40 to 50 cents to mm -hmm. that dollar. Um, you know, when we're talking about AAPI populations, it depends inside AAPI, and that breakdown is so poorly done. Okay, great. Um, because Asian women in tech are making a lot more than say Asian women who are working in um, harvest or restaurants or any of these things, okay? So when we're talking about who leads the pack in feminism, who has the time to show up, because there's a lot of unpaid work, right? And then there's being seen, writing books, being on TV, all of that. It are often women who are coming in and they never had to worry about food, shelter, all of these issues. And privilege is a bubble, but privilege is also sort of like when you put blinders on a horse, right? so that the horse is only focused on what's in front of it and it doesn't get into collisions with other horses on a racetrack. Yeah, it's a myopic view. Right, exactly. So you can have that view like this and then you can think everyone else is running the same race and starting from the same point. That's not true. But you have no reason because this is a weird side effect of Jim Crow. Although people of color often have white friends, white people rarely have friends of color, right? So. And I, I don't mean they don't know anyone of color. They may work with them. They may see them at the gym. They may, you know, interact with each other in a casual way. But the bubble in America is not the liberal bubble. The bubble is the segregation bubble. So if you grow up in a majority white space and you say, well, racism was never a problem where I grew up. Well, racism wasn't, pro wasn't a problem where you grew up because there was no one else of color there. Or hardly anyone of color, right? That didn't happen by accident. But okay, let's say you don't realize it. And then you go to a good college, you become a feminist, you're fighting for equality, and nowhere in there do you talk to women who are having a different experience than you. You may talk about them, you may hear about them on the news, but you don't have any relationships, you don't have any connections. And as a result, you think you know what they're experiencing and that all they have to do is work hard. All they have to do is do what you're doing. You can 
be in a privilege bubble and never see the ways that your race and class are propelling you forward. Now, I think that it's ridiculous in 2020 and really in 20 anything not to use the magic of Google to figure this out, not to use social media to figure it out. But I will say that for a lot of white upper middle class, middle class upper middle class women, they don't know because they don't have to know. But they're feminists. They want equality. They do. They just don't want to think about the fact that the playing field isn't level because then they might have to interrogate white supremacy. And that's a little more difficult. That's a little more uncomfortable because it might mean looking at their uncles, their parents, Aunt Susan and her potato salad with the raisins and thinking some uncomfortable things, right? <laughs> I knew you were going to find a way to work that one in there. Raisins and potato salad is a thing I have not, y'all. I'm not okay. It's not okay. Stop that. Don't do that anymore. I mean, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a really long, there's a very strong thread in a lot of the discussions that you've had about this and in, and in your book where community and community, intra-community support among uh, Black women in the same neighborhood, among other women of color as, as just a thing that is feminist in, um, it's feminist in function without some of us really realizing how it is feminism. And that tie of community action and listening and looking out for each other is something that actually I never really felt was highlighted in mainstream feminism. There's a lot of like, yes, we're women and we should support each other, but the actual connecting of communities of women to each other is something that you talk about a lot. And I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about why that isn't reflected in mainstream feminism so much when that has been really the experience of so many women, particularly of color, even if we don't know that we're feminist before we even know to call ourselves feminists. I think part of it is because, yes, we compete with each other, but we know that in order to survive, we've got to work together. And when you don't have to worry about your basic survival, I think you just start to focus on the competition part. And you don't have to think in terms of community other than the chosen community you create, right? Whereas if you were facing multiple axes of oppression, to be honest, you know that sometimes you're gonna have to deal with people inside your community who are great, but they're still part of your community. They still look out for you. You know, um, one of the things I talk about in feminism is the, the idea that the hood doesn't hate smart people. I grew up on the South Side, and I know that there's someone somewhere out there who will say, well, like, well, how did they feel about you being smart? You know, that they would well, make people mad. And my nickname was Books, and I got teased. Everybody got teased because kids are jerks. Kids are, like, it's genetic. We're jerks. We're all jerks together. Um, but those same people that I grew up with that would tease me and call me Books were also folks, if I had a problem, if I had a need, if I had any concerns, they were concerned about me. Even now, when someone gets on the internet and says something nasty, there are kids I grew up with who are on Facebook or elsewhere who are quick, quick. Oh, I know you don't got her name in your mouth. I, I, she don't fight, but I do kind of personality. And they're like that because even when we had conflict, we all knew we were in it together. I think mainstream Feminism has often preached this idea that they're competing to break the glass ceiling, competing to get up there on the same level with white men. Well, really, you're competing to be an oppressor, if that's your framework. And if that's your framework, to be equal to white men and not to bring about equality for all, it's very easy to then see other women as competition and not as sisterhood. And then when it comes to, you know, sort of building solidarity, it's difficult to undo the damage done by bigotry, right? So that you're going to have to apologize, check yourself, show up for people, even when it's uncomfortable, right? Whether that means speaking up in the meeting about Frank who always steals ideas or backing up the person when they say, you know, so-and-so never wants to hire anyone with braids or locks or whatever. And then, you know, solidarity can't be a one-way street. You can't expect people to support you and never support them. And unfortunately, 
middle class, upper middle class feminism is often said, well, where are the people backing us up? These issues are important to us and then we will get to your issues later. People who are going hungry, who are unhoused, who don't have access to medical care, who have to worry about accessing basic needs, they're busy. They're busy with survival. They're busy fighting for those basic rights. And then when you say, well, those aren't feminist issues, what you're really saying is that you don't care about the women who are not in the same position that you are. So you have to start by recognizing if you want this big feminist monolith to get somewhere, right? And I would argue it's not a single monolith. It is a, a bunch of intersecting, overlapping umbrellas. You're going to have to show up for the issues that don't impact you, right? Just like I, as a cis woman, should be showing up when trans and non-binary people need backup. I would expect white women to show up for things that don't impact. Right in the middle of the pandemic, I, I really didn't want to see you were upset that your maid couldn't come. I just mm. that happened. Yeah, yeah, I know that <laughs> that happened. I really wanted to see some concern about you know essential workers, including the ones in grocery stores, the people delivering things to your home. What was going to happen to their kids if we said all the kids stay home from school? Because those kids had to go somewhere. Those kids need access to someone to care for them. Those kids need you to make sure their schools are showing up for online learning and creating some kind of setup for them. Those kids and their parents need living wages to be paid, right? You need to be making sure that these companies, whether it's Amazon or Walmart or whatever, are paying their employees enough to live on. Because right now, if you're talking about whether it's domestic workers or retail workers, I'm going to ask a, a fun question that I want the audience to think about. A lot of us are working from home, but you can't work from home to, to harvest food or, you know, deliver or prepare food, all of these things. What do you think is happening to folks who make less than $15 an hour? Because in Chicago, 15 bucks an hour, which is where we were headed for as our minimum wage, actually is the living wage. I believe it's something like 20 or $22 an hour for Chicago. I would argue more like 25 um, with taxes and other things. A living wage, which minimum wage was supposed to be a living wage, and we've sort of forgotten that. A living wage in America is closer to $25 an hour. In some places, it's more like 40 um, New York and LA are kind of springing to mind. Silicon Valley area is a number that I can't even conceive of. Um, <laughs> but if we're going to say we're here and feminism has got to come together, we've got to build this intersectional concept, great. The intersectional construct would require us to think about basic needs before breaking the final tier glass ceiling to be a CEO. And I'm not saying you can't be a CEO. I can't, I'm not even saying that shouldn't be your goal. But what are you going to do with that power when you get Because if you're going to be a CEO and keep doing the same things the male CEO you replaced was doing, that's not feminism. I don't know what to call that, but it's not equality or equity for all women. It's just you getting ahead at the expense of everyone else. And then keeping the same broken systems going and hoping it doesn't bite you personally in the back, even though you know that it's harming hundreds of thousands of other people, right? It's not enough to chase power in feminism. You have to be planning to do something good with that power. Otherwise, you're just passing one bad baton from one hand to the other. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, like, we've talked about this before, how this is, often a thing where main f mainstream feminism has stopped is the acquisition of power and the acquisition of the same power and control that men have is usually where those discussions stop. But what you and what you have been pushing for and what other women of color have been pushing for is the idea that no, that's not where you stop because once you get there, the conversation has to continue because you need to think about what are you going to do with it. And right. where do you build it? How, right, it's not enough to take the power if all you're going to do is keep the same structure. And, you know, hey, I took this power and now I'm king of the mountain, but the mountain is still resting on everyone else. 
we kind of got to be planning to get the power to take the mountain off everyone else's back or we're, we're just going to push the problem forward yeah this always makes me think about uh, because I, I was a huge good place fan there was the you know the overarching question of what do we owe each other right and I feel like that is a question that feminism doesn't actually really ask women to ask ourselves, what do we owe each other? What do we owe our communities? And I feel like that is, that is something that you are constantly, it's not spelled out, but it is part of the ethos of what you're writing about in Hood Feminism is asking feminists to think about what we owe to each other and what we do, what we, what our obligations and responsibilities are once we acquire power. So I actually, we want to, uh, I know we, you wanted a chance to talk about uh, IEP and Chicago Public Schools because you had feelings, <laughs> but I know we need to make sure we have time for, audi for audience questions. So obviously if we can take, you want to take five minutes and to sort of talk a little bit more about the Chicago Public Schools? Yes, let's listen. I actually even need a full five minutes. I'm going to say this. Okay. CPS has to, first of all, it needs an elected school board. It needs an elected school board so bad, I can taste it. Then, uh, the next time they tell you about a TIF fund and how they want to spend it on a stadium, a flower pot, I don't care. I don't care what they want to spend it on. I don't even care. You should be asking where those dollars are going in schools and whether or not those dollars are going to make sure schools are meeting the needs of the children of Chicago. Right? Because here's another fun fact. Remember all those school closures? You know why we're having such a hard time in the pandemic? Why it's just so terrible? All of our schools were overcrowded already. It's really hard to socially distance in classroom sizes of 30 plus. Can't do it. So if you, as a parent, as a neighbor, as a person who cares at all about a city's health, are able to go to those meetings, are able to push not just for an elected school board, for, but for school funding. And I know people are say, well, schools get so much money. Yes, how is it being spent? Because often, as we're seeing with putting cops in schools, even if schools say we don't want a community officer, they don't get that money back to fund the position they actually need. They just don't get the funds at all. So you need to be asking, real hard questions in a city where we saw an officer drag a girl down the stairs, where we've seen kids preyed upon by, you know, off-duty folks, we'll put it that way, right? Chicago has a problem. Chicago has a series of problems in their schools. Well, it doesn't mean throw away public schooling. It does, though, mean showing up for young women, for their communities around them, for, for saying to the city, all these taxes that you want, all this revenue you say you need, spend it in the neighborhoods, not just in the loop, right? You could roll those bridges up all you want, but you wouldn't have had to worry about it if you didn't have the kind of city that has a police torture center that has billions, and I do literally mean billions of dollars spent um, outside on settling police misconduct, but can't find funds to make sure that kids have after school programs, that mental health clinics are open, that people are eating, right? These are some very basic things. You, you're like, oh, Chicago is so violent, there's so much crime. People sell drugs because they don't have money. That's, that's really it. There's, there's a lack of transit, there's a lack of jobs, there's a lack, there's a lack. And then we say, well, why are they going to these illicit economies? I want you to go down the 63rd. I want you to go past Hyde Park and, and Woodlawn. I want you to go to that space between the red line and the green line. And I want you to look around at how many boarded up buildings you see, how many burned down and empty lots you see. And I want you to ask what happened to the TIF funds that didn't redevelop those areas? What happened to the TIF funds that have places boarded up on the north side, on the west side, on the south side? DePaul got a new stadium. Like we got a lot of pretty stuff, a lot of pretty stuff. But Chicago rakes in $900 million or something a year to have funds. Where is it going? Because it's not going back to you, the people paying it. I think that is an excellent place to stop.
and open it up for Q&A, which uh, Jane was going to be kind enough to read for us. Yes. Um, we've had quite a few comments come in just at the end. And I'm going to, because you were just talking about the school, I'm going to start with the school questions. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asks, what is the number one thing um, I can do as a young adult without children to support the CPS? Um, um, we've had a few suggestions about running for local school council, but I, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. So I'm going to say not just local skill council, but also reach out. Um, the PTA at your local schools often is not just running fundraisers. They're looking for people to help with a variety of things, maybe everything from tutoring um, to calling that alderman, that local alderman about problems in the area, because you'd be amazed how many PTA parents and teachers can tell you all about what's going on this. It may mean showing up to those meetings when they tell you they want to close a school or add on to another school that is already heavily funded. Um, it may mean showing up often in your alderman or the mayor's e email, wherever, right? And asking some hard questions. And if you're in a journalist, journalism adjacent, even if you just write a blog, talking about the things happening in your neighborhood, making sure people know that the, the, the deal on offer of, oh, well, we're going to add on to this school in Lincoln Park. Cool. What are we doing about overcrowding in this neighborhood next to that? What are we doing about overcrowding as a whole in the city? Because right now, we're seeing with distance learning, and a lot of people wanted kids to be able to go back to school. I'm going to tell you honestly, many Chicago high schools are overcrowded. And they're overcrowded in a way where the fire code was probably going to kick in soon. So you should be asking, hey, what's the plan when they do go back to school? What's the plan for class size? Don't tell me we have to have 37 when as soon as you leave the city of Chicago, class sizes cap out at under 30. In some places, class sizes cap out at 20. It's not that we don't have the teachers. It's not that we don't have the kids. It's that they told you classrooms are being underutilized and their metric had was shifted, so utilization was 37. Full utilization and became 37 instead of 30. So you have to ask politicians, not just when they want to get elected, but at every step in between elections, what they're doing and how they're doing at the schools. And you will see parents talking about, and this was one of our more recent scandals, um, special education funds being, instead of being spent on kids with IEPs, going into the general fund, and then those dollars going unaccounted. Every year, CPS has an inspector general report. CPS kind of counts on you not reading or following up on those things. And the IG report often reveals that CPS's money is funny. The money coming in from the city and the state, and then the way it's being apportioned. And part of that is because you may not know this either. Schools get their budget based off student enrollment. And they get their budget, I want to say it's like, September is the initial, I think the final numbers are in October. But what their budget is and what their needs are, they're like this, right? And it's easy to blame teachers, but the administration, and by administration, I don't mean Chicago schools, I mean the mayor and the alderman, they're really making the decisions about what they will fund and what they will provide extra funds for. It's very easy to get a cop in Chicago public schools. It was very difficult and continues to be very difficult to get a nurse assigned to a school to get a speech therapist or a pathologist assigned to a school for them to fund those positions. Not that they lack the money, but the way they're choosing to use the money. So you need to be in a politician's space, in the mayor's space, in an alderman's space. And whether you have children right now or not, if you're going to have kids, if you live in the neighborhood, you should care what's happening because ultimately the impact of their bad decisions of a lack of after school programs, um, of students being brutalized by staff, you know, by police officers, that comes to your door too. And oh yeah, as somebody in, in the comments, I'm, just, I'm finally seeing pop-up comments, my nurses aren't paid that great. Because we pay, that 35,000 can pay for a nurse that they're spending on pops. They could, they could go to fund the nurse's salary. If you go to fund the school counselor's salary, there are a lot of places that money could go. That is not a cut. And someone made a comment too in here about um, in 
in regards to that question that the person was asking about the CPS, um, fighting TIFs taking money from the schools, and you mentioned TIFs a little bit, um, the tax incremental funding. This is, seems to be like a, a voting a voting information issue. You need to know who you're voting for. Is that correct? You need to know who you're voting for, and you need to know that, I, I'm going to be honest, I know that there are good and valid reasons for TIFs, but largely TIFs have been used to rip off the city of Chicago. The residents of the city of Chicago are here. That money is taken in, that money ends up funding various development projects, and there's very little oversight. And they say that there's going to be oversight, but now is a wonderful time for you to really start asking at those meetings about that oversight. Make them know people are looking. Ask questions about where that money is going and how it's being used. Because to some degree, I am an old Chicago person, I grew up here. I don't really believe the political party makes much of a difference. We have had Republicans and we've had Democrats and whatever. And eh, I'm not a fan of politicians. You have to tell the people who want to put their hand in the cookie jar that you're watching what they do. You have to be watching them all the time. And you have to make it very uncomfortable for them to go to that cookie jar. Very, very uncomfortable. Because once they get comfortable, we have to arrest a governor. It's basically what happens. We have to arrest multiple governors, let's be real. I mean, governors, councilmen, senators, you know, handcuffs come out here a lot for some real good reasons. <laughs> okay. Um, there's, let's see, um, which one do I want to do next? Okay. You mentioned, Mitch, Mitchie, this was a quote that you said, and I really like this phrase, and I'm going to weave it into this next question. What do we owe each other? Um, someone had mentioned when we help each other, we all benefit. Um, I find it's a really hard message to get across these days. There's a lot of noise and there's a lot of people thinking that if you take something, if you give something to someone else, you're taking something from me. Um, is there a way to get through the noise? Do we start with our communities first, our local communities, our neighborhoods, our, our cities, towns? Is there an institutional address to this? How do we, how do you think we should take care of something like that? And this, as much as I think, like, it, this is a, a huge, huge problem. I mean, where do you have the most impact? I mean, if your family members listen to you, if you're the, if you're the loud mouth in your group of friends, if you're, you happen to be the person who is the one who is uh, organizing, you know, your social outings, um, use that power and try to like try to use it to organize your the people who who trust you who uh listen to what you have to say and try to organize them into doing things and you can you can demonstrate how i mean like the phrase that i use this all the time in pop culture is like the pie is infinite it's a lie that by taking some by giving something to someone else you're inherently taking something away from me because even if it's a specific resource that, yes, I'm giving up, you know, let's say some of my tax money to go fund this other thing, the benefits from this thing being funded will come back to me by having a healthier community, by having people who around me who have their basic needs met and will actually be able to be, will have more choices, can actually be happy, can be productive in the ways that are healthy for them. Um, we need to stop looking at things in very concrete, well, if I give this away, then I'm losing a thing. You might be losing that one thing, but where, are you, where else are you getting it back? It's a very, you know, Mickey and I talked about this again, like the myopia of what we lose and what we're getting back. We need to expand our viewpoint, and that means talking to other people and actually being willing to listen to people who have, diff who come from different experiences, particularly people who have left less privileges than we do. I come from an upper middle class background. Um, there are lots of things that I never thought about um, just because they were never within my sphere of awareness growing up. But my obligation is once I become aware of those things, I can't ignore them because then that becomes a choice. Mm -hmm. Once you make the conscious choice to ignore the consequences of your decisions and the consequences of your use or refusal to use power. That is when you, when you become complicit. Mm -hmm. 
And I would add on to that, and I'm going to use a slightly different analogy. Um, if you read fairy tales, there are those stories of the goose that laid the golden egg, the magic bag out of which all your needs can come. In many ways, that's the point of taxes. That's the point of, of this. Your needs are supposed to be met by you paying into this communal pot, right? Stone soup. And so if you are thinking to yourself, well, this thing doesn't meet my needs, okay, but something someone else did does meet your needs. So you're just really passing around the needs being met. You're not going with that, right? If you have a, if you have eaten more than enough, and now you have slightly less, more than enough, it does you no harm to make sure somebody else has enough. If you both have enough, great. If multiple people have enough, great, right? You may not be able to afford your, your mythical, temporarily embarrassed millionaires um, or billionaires for yachts, but you really didn't need the four yachts. You needed housing and food and health care, and you got all of those things. You should want to make sure everyone has all of those things. Um, we've got time for one more question, and it's, it's two people asked sort of the same thing, so I'm going to kind of try and combine them. Um, do you have any ideas about intersectional solidarity building? And the second part of it is what is the number one thing we can do right now to support other women in Chicago? So this is actually really the same thing. Um, currently, the number one thing you could do is show up for people who have less than you, right? We know that we've got a housing crisis. I understand the CDC has, has pushed through a thing where they will stop um, evictions, except the plan is a little bizarre because it looks like you're still gonna owe them money, even if you don't get evicted. So that doesn't really help you. It just moves the problem down the road to later. Um, and that's only through, I think, the end of the year. So this means right now showing up, whether it's with funds or time for the Greater Chicago Food Depository, being willing to help with tutoring or childcare or whatever your skill set is for kids in your neighborhood through the library or, or whatever, right? There are programs all over the place in which you can volunteer to help, but also then being willing to listen to the needs of the people in your community. Because I, I suspect as we get closer to winter, winter in Chicago is a monster, right? Those utility bills are gonna come due. And the financial hit of those utility bills is going to be one for the records, I suspect. Given, I know everyone's been talking about fires and hurricanes, but we also have polar vortexes, right? The fact that we're not on deck right now doesn't mean we won't be on deck later. And I don't know if you all remember this, but the last couple of years when that has hit, we have had a real problem with seniors and others really having to go without, kids not having coats. All of these things, right? These things, these mutual aid networks are going to need your assistance. Whether that's money, whether that's extra stuff you have, right? Whether you're gonna donate to the food drive. Side note, please stop giving cans to food banks. I know everyone loves to donate cans to food banks and you often donate cans as a result of dirt. Give them cash. Give them cash. They can buy more food than you can. They can buy better things, more recent things. So if you have a sudden impulse right now to go out and donate, great. If you have the cash to donate, donate the cash. If you have the time to donate, donate the time. If you absolutely cannot donate anything but canned goods, I mean, I guess it would be more useful for you to put them on your front porch with a sign that says free than for you to donate the old can of corn that you never wanted to eat to the food bank. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, but that building intersectional solidarity requires trust. It requires mutual aid. It requires showing up as an equal and listening. Well, right now, in particular, building that trust is going to look a lot like doing what you can to make sure that people's needs are met before you ask them for anything. Before you say, well, we've got to do something with this election. With, 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 with. And I understand voting is important. The election is important. But we're asking people who barely can keep their heads above water to fight. Can't keep doing that. You got to help them get their head out of the water. You're going to have to show up for people if you want them to show up for you. The thing I would add to that also is when you are looking for ways to help and you're coming up with ideas for how to help, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't think that just because 
you have come up, you, you have the desire to help and you're really passionate about it and you think you can build this thing, particularly if you are not from the communities you are trying to help, particularly if you are coming to this from a place of privilege and you just learned about this thing and you really, really want to help, don't try to go in and lead. You should be going into those communities and asking, what can I do to help? Where can I best be useful? And going into it and basically putting yourself down at the bottom of that ladder and saying, tell me what to do. Don't go into these communities and try to tell them what you think you sh they should be doing. The best way to help is to offer your skills, your resources, your time and your energy and do so humbly without, feel without making it about you and your desire to help. Great point, very good point. Um, we're getting a lot of comments here too. People are saying, yes, listen. And I think listening is a really important point to make here. We, we do need to, as white women feminists, follow the lead and not try and take the lead because that's what we've been doing too often, I think. Um, well, we're sort of out of time with the questions here. I'm going to um, just do a quick wrap. If we didn't ask your question, please stay on Zoom for a few minutes after I say thank you to everybody and you'll get a chance to speak to the authors directly. Um, if you like today's program, we hope you'll join us again on Thursday, October 22nd for a program that honors the Illinois women involved in the push for women gaining the right to vote, followed by a discussion of what voters' rights mean to all of us in 2020. Um, you'll find more information in the chat window. I posted it a few seconds ago. Um, also in the chat window is information about purchasing hood feminism at our neighborhood independent bookstore, Women and Children First. And for a limited time, they have copies available that will include an autographed book plate um, that Mickey was kind enough to supply to the store. So please support our writers and our indies. Our bookstores and our writers really need the help too. Um, finally, the mission of the Friends is to support our branch library through advocacy and also by providing supplemental funds for books and materials and other things that the library's yearly budget doesn't cover. Um, until this year, our largest fundraiser has been our Friends book sale, which we usually hold in September. But with gatherings in the library suspended, we've had to cancel these events and Friends of the Edgewater Library is now relying on memberships and small donations in order to continue our work. If you find value in all the thought provoking programs that we're bringing to you and you appreciate the way we support our branch library, we hope you'll consider supporting us by joining the Friends for as little as $10 a year. You can also visit our website, foelchicago.org to join us or to make a one-time donation in any amount. Um, there's more information, as I said, in the chat bar. Mickey and Mitchie, thank you so much for appearing with us and for this frank and engaging conversation. It's only really by tackling these subjects with honesty and openness that we begin to make the changes in ourselves and in our communities. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thanks all. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much.